is right now. Share screen. Okay. Um, okay. Welcome everybody uh, to, to our session here. Uh, let me see who else is here right now at this moment. We have... Do, 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 do. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, we have in the previous session uh, talked about this thing, a question that was asked concerning life. Uh, and last week, we were actually at this part uh, where we are talking about the Bible. Um. Let me go straight, uh, because we were talking on the Bible. Let me go straight to the portion of the Bible. Uh. Now, last week we mentioned that if we believe that there is a God out there waiting for us to find Him, uh, then we must believe that, they, that He will provide us a way uh, in which to find Him. And we have discussed uh, uh, one of the ways... Uh, uh, sorry. Okay. One of the ways uh, that in, in order to find us is that he will give us a written message. And we say uh, that the written message uh, that is given by him uh, is the Bible. Now the Bible, we have mentioned that the Bible contains three parts. Uh, it's broken in three parts. And these three parts are, it contains history, it contains prophecies, it contains teachings. Now, as far as the Bible is concerned, okay, how do we know that the Bible is true? We say that if we compare the origin of the Bible, how the Bible come about, like in every instance, uh, history books and all these things, uh, um, somebody, on, uh, uh, I, I think some of you have, have, uh, uh, I, I think some of you is is on um, has not unmute your thing, so uh, it's interfering. Okay, so now if uh, we compare to the other writings, uh, like for example, uh, other manuscripts of uh, the Greek or the C, for example, okay, so all those classical writings, we have said that basically they we can only find back twenty copies of that. And we add top, make them how tall they are. They are about four feet tall. Compared to the writings of the Bible, the New Testament itself is about one mile tall, you know, because it has about 15,000 uh, complete fragments and all these things. Okay. And compared to it, it's about 15,000, uh, it's about uh, one mile tall. Uh, what that means to say is that uh, it's about 2,000 times uh, more than the other classical writings on the average classical writings. The other thing is that if we compare the whole Bible, that means Old and New Testament is about 2.5 miles, miles tall. You know? So it's a, there's a whole lot of more evidence uh, uh, concerning the Bible, more than all the other books uh, that is there. Now, what does that mean? Uh, is that uh, if we say, that the Bible cannot be believed, then uh, we can throw away all the history books because there's so much supporting evidence uh, of the Bible. And if we cannot accept the Bible, how can we accept the history books? Because you have, you're talking a few thousand times more historical courts uh, of the Bible compared to all the other books. So based on archaeological findings, we said that the Bible is something that is real. We have also talked about archaeological findings. Okay. When you talk about archaeological findings, it means that now, besides the Bible, is there any other records uh, in history that actually gives you some findings that the Bible is true? Okay, because the Bible that we get today, is there any evidence, old evidence uh, that proves that the Bible is true? And we say that there is evidence of Dead Sea Scrolls uh, that was discovered uh, in 
uh, the last century. And that the records of this uh, date back uh, to as far as 250 BC. That means we got original records uh, of copies of the Bible. Okay, and uh, this is close contains uh, every written book in the Old Testament other than the book of Esther. Okay, and we have also uh, from other historical records uh, from other uh, the other uh, what you call that other civilization, uh, early civilization, the Syrian civilization, which has contains uh, writings uh, concerning what is written in the Bible, for example, the house of David. And so therefore, from the Syrian dynasty, uh, that we find uh, that there was a record of the house of David, so that we know that David is a person that is real. Okay? He is found in other uh, records of other civilization as well. We have also... Uh, this uh, unroll seal cave and all these things, uh, okay, uh, this belongs uh, to another dynasty. Okay, okay, the Lakish relief, the Assyrians record. Okay, Hezekiah tunnel that if you go to Jerusalem, you can see uh, inside this tunnel, you know, some recordings that proves that the Bible, uh, some the recordings of the Bible. Uh, is also substantiated by writings that we can currently go and view ourselves. Uh, and also, like for example, the Babylonian Chronicle, uh, this is something concerning the Babylon civilization uh, that we can have a record to show that the Bible recording of Nebuchadnezzar campaign against Jerusalem is real. The Mobite Stone, okay, and this is concerning the Mobite civilization. Okay, the Menepa steel of Egyptian, the Egyptian civilization, they have this record about the enslavement of the Israelites. We have also Cyrus Selinda, the Persian, uh, this is a Persian king. We have also the Assyrian Limu. Okay, so all these are some of the archaeological findings uh, which, which prove that the Bible records uh, things that are recorded in the Bible is true. Let's go back. Oh, sorry. Oh. Let's go back to the Bible again. Okay. Now, we also have talked about Bible variances uh, last week. Uh. Let's look at some of the Bible variances. Some people say, sir, how do we know that the Bible is true? Okay. Yeah, you talk about how tall your record is and all these things, uh, how, how many records you have of the Bible. But then uh, they say that if I were to look at the Bible, uh, how come uh, this book in the Bible and that book in the Bible uh, records uh, sometimes the things uh, seem to be you know, contradict each other? And they say that, uh, and they say this, okay, there are many differences. For example, the differences uh, which they use uh, as their version of the is that they are spelling errors. Okay, the words, uh, for example, uh, in, 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 in the New Testament, you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. All these books uh, are records uh, of an account by different authors talking about Jesus Christ. So when you talk about these things, uh, sometimes it says that, oh, okay, uh, the Bible records, uh, okay, uh, this thing happened this time. But in another version, it happened at another time. So, and then when they compare the different manuscripts, okay, they say that, oh, this manuscript uh, has this spelling like this, and that spelling is like that. So there's spelling errors, okay. This word comes first, the other word comes first because they compare different manuscripts of the Bible, different versions of the Bible, different copies. They say that it's different. Sometimes the use of the words are also different. So when they look at all these differences, uh, it's interesting to note that uh, although the New Testament got only about 184,000 words, the critics uh, could find out about 500,000 variances uh, based on the birth. No? Can you imagine? 
the critics uh, go on to extend and say, that, oh, there's so many different 500,000 variances. When actually the New Testament Bible has only 184,000 words. So how could such variances come up? They, gone, they went, went on to, and all this counting were based on, oh, there are some spelling errors, the word order is different, the use of words are different. But if we do take at a close look at all these errors they're pointing out, uh, 99% has no impact on the message. Uh, one of the examples that I pointed out was, for example, casting out demons. Okay? In Mark chapter 9, verse 29, you, go, you read there, casting out demons, uh, he says it's by fasting and prayer. Some versions don't have fasting. Some versions have fasting and the prayer is in bracket. And, and the word they use in the Bible, it says that in other manuscripts contain the word fasting. So, so now the question is, so does the Bible have fasting and prayer? The issue is this. Okay. What Jesus Christ's message is, sometimes when you cast out demons, uh, okay, you have to pray. And does that mean to say is that uh, the message of Jesus Christ was wrong? No. It's just that the manuscript contains this thing. So that uh, the overall message is that uh, when you want to cast out demons, you have to pray. Some manuscript contain fasting. So now you ask yourself a question. Is it biblical uh, that when you pray and when you do not get it, uh, you also fast? Is that a biblical teaching as well? Yes, it is. But they make it an issue that this is like this. And I have also mentioned another instance uh, concerning uh, when Jesus Christ uh, uh, told Peter that before, uh, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Now, that was in Matthew, Luke and John. Matthew, Luke and John says that before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. But in Mark, uh, the words record that before the cock crow twice, you will deny me three times. The issue is this. Uh, what was the message of Jesus Christ to Peter? The message of Jesus Christ to Peter was that you will deny me three times. That is the most important part of it. But for, the, for them, uh, for many of them, they felt that Oh, it's so important that two times or three times. Now, there are explanations for all these variances. Okay, uh, last week I actually explained on this before. But uh, 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 I'm not going to explain it again. Okay, uh, if you need to me to explain that, I will explain to you at a different occasion. Okay, now, what, what I'm trying to say is that uh, 99% of all these variances uh, has no impact on the message at all. Okay? So, and the whole reason why uh, there are so many variances uh, is because there are too many manuscripts. Okay? There's so much evidence uh, of records uh, that this incident happened. And that's why, because so many times you'll copy and copy and copy, and sometimes you'll miss out on all these things. As a result, we shall. Uh, some of these things uh, happens. But the fact that so many of these manuscripts exist tells you that this incident actually happened. That should be the point that we should note. Okay? How do we deal with all these variances? We have to look into the context in which the Bible verses is re written, collaborate with other verses, do not force a meaning. Remember, the Bible is not made up of one verse. So sometimes when we read the Bible, it says that, oh, is this correct one? We have to look at the context in which it's written. If we need be, go back to do an interlinear check. That means look back into the original Greek meaning, look back at the original Hebrew writings and see what actually was it written, how was it written. For example, many of us, uh, uh, when we look at the Bible, if you are English speaking, Okay, you have King James Version, you have English Standard Versions, you have uh, new, uh, new International Versions, you have Revised Standard Versions. You've got so many versions, you know. And then when you read them together, sometimes it says that 
oh, the King James Version is different from the Revised Standard Version. Which one do I believe? You know, it doesn't mean that the Bible is wrong. It just means it says that when you look at it, maybe you want to check, you go back to the original Greek and find out how it was written. And then you say, under the context of how it's written, this is how it's interpreted. And when you read the Bible verses, you have actually have to look into the other supporting. That means you may want to cross-reference to another verse in the Bible to understand fully what does this Bible verse means. Okay, so remember, the Bible is not made up by one verse alone. Okay. Now, variances do not prove the Bible is not authentic. Okay, and I mentioned that you know we have many Bible, many, many English Bible versions, and all this uh, is based on this Ellen Nestle Greek compilation script. Okay, so there may be differences in how the words are used, positioning, emphasis may be different. So remember one thing, we say is that when you read the Bible, the Bible is supposed to give life. Don't read it, don't read it literally. It's more important to understand the message than to count the number of words, whether the order of the words is like this or not. That's not so important. Okay. And lastly, okay, when we read the Bible, because the Bible tells us uh, the letter kills, but the Spirit giveth life. What it actually means is that uh, when we read the Bible, we must open our minds to the Bible uh, and to find out uh, what exactly God wants us to learn. That means we've got to pray. Okay? You will have to learn to pray. Now let's go back uh, to this part, okay, the next session. Uh, prophecies fulfill uh, proof authenticity. Okay. Uh, let me just get out a screen. Uh, I want to share with you something. Uh. Uh, up to this stage, uh, uh, any of us got any questions? Anyone? Uh, let me see who else is here. Uh, any, any, anybody have any question up to this stage? John? Uh, not for the moment, sir. <laughs> not for the moment, huh? Yeah. Okay. Let me, uh, let me stop share for a short while. Uh, I want to give you an uh, illustration on this. Huh? Now, now, can you see this? Can you see this uh, words file? Can I? Uh? Okay. Now, just talk about prophecy on Jesus Christ, uh, okay? Because uh, one of the topics that we're going to talk about is Jesus Christ, uh, which will be in subsequent sessions, uh, okay? Now, many of us will be interested uh, because Jesus Christ says, uh, he said, read the scriptures, for they are they that testify of me. And he says that the, the prophets, the law, and the writings, uh, and the psalms, uh, they are the things that testify of me. So let me ask you a question. Uh, do you know that there are many writings in the Bible concerning Jesus Christ, uh, which was fulfilled with Jesus Christ? Let me just give you some of these writings. Uh, for example, we say that 
Adam, uh, in Romans chapter 5, verse 14, he says that Adam is a type of Christ because actions affected many people. Okay? So, in, in Genesis chapter 3, okay, verse 17 to 19. Genesis chapter 3, Sorry, uh, sorry. Genesis chapter uh, type of price because effect in seventeen nineteen. Chapter five verse fourteen. Let me just read this. Sorry, yeah. Romans chapter 5, verse 14. Okay. In Romans chapter 5, verse 14, they said, Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even those whose sin was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who is to come. So what it sees inside here, it talks about sinning. Okay, about sinning. In Genesis chapter 3, uh, verse 17 to 19, uh, it talks about uh, the effects of sin. It's effects of sin. So, the fulfillment in the Bible, okay, now I have about 100 over verses here, okay, and I will share this verse uh, with you all. You all can go back and see uh, the fulfillment of these prophecies concerning Jesus Christ. Uh, okay, uh, later, after this, I'll, I'll put this into the WhatsApp group. Uh, you can share. But what I'm trying to say is that uh, many things are uh, written in Old Testament concern Jesus Christ. And so therefore, when we read the Bible, Jesus Christ says, uh, these are testimonies of those things that happen concerning me you know, in the Old Testament. You can find this. And these are being fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Now, some of the prophecies, I will, I will share this with you all later. So, uh, so later on, you, you can go and do your own reading on this. Huh? Let me go back on the screen in itself. Huh? Uh, share screen. Okay. Now, one of the prophecies that, that uh, perhaps is well known to all of us uh, is the uh, dream uh, that Nebuchadnezzar had. Okay, Nebuchadnezzar had. So what was the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had? Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, uh, and in this dream, he dreamed uh, that uh, uh, there was an image, okay, and the image of the head was gold, his breast was, uh, was silver, and then the the well, the arms and all these things was bronze. And then after that, the legs uh, was iron. And then the feet uh, was clay and, and iron. So this prophecy, as we know, uh, depicts uh, the head of gold was the Babylon Empire. And after which, uh, followed by the Persian Empire of silver. And then the Greek era was in bronze, followed by the Roman Empire. Now, many historians, when they look at the account of uh, Daniel, they say that it couldn't possibly be written by Daniel. You know, they say that it couldn't possibly be written because it was so accurate uh, concerning the succession of dynasties. It was so accurate. They said, how could man uh, write an account like this? You know? they, say, they say that it's possibly, most likely, uh, these things uh, was somebody no, after the era, he wrote back uh, concerning these things that happened. No, they, they came to this conclusion, you know, because why? It was so accurate. But do you know one thing or not? The prophecy uh, that, that Daniel uh, interpreted uh, out of the dreams of Nebuchadnezzar 
It's still happening now, you know. Because what happened is this, uh, the Babylon Empire is gone. The Persian Empire is gone. The Grecian Empire is gone. The Roman Empire is gone. But the last empire, which was the feet, uh, which was made of clay and, and iron, uh, is now happening, you know. Look at the, the world we have today, you know. Yes, we know that we say that US is world power, you know, but there is Russia. Okay? And the US cannot say I dominate any other country, you know. No. Right now we are an error that not one single empire dominate all the other empires. In the past, uh, we have people like Hitler. <laughs> he tried to conquer the world and he failed. Before him uh, was Napoleon. He tried to conquer. He also failed. Okay? We are at a stage here where we say that it is a time when no single empire conquered is dominant over all the other empires. And the prophecy here is still not the end. The prophecy ends with that there will be an uncut stone from heaven that falls down and it will destroy all these things and you form a mountain out of it. What it actually means is that uh, at this time when the nations are all divided, there will come a time when Christ will come again to build what he call the eternal kingdom. And according to the prophecies that is mentioned, uh, when God comes, uh, everything will be destroyed. And the fulfillment of the prophecy is that there will be an eternal kingdom and that eternal kingdom is the heavenly kingdom. Of course, we want to be on the right side of God when the time comes. Uh. So the thing is, uh, the prophecies uh, that is going to be fulfilled. Now, let's look at one of the things. Uh, um, uh, prophecies, what happened to this? I got, uh, it didn't go to that person. Wait, uh, sorry. Ah, okay. Bible prophecies. <laughs> okay. Now, the one thing uh, that the Bible mentioned about Bible prophecy is this. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 21 to 22. Uh, Brother Tom, can you read? Deuteronomy chapter 21, 18, verse 21 to 22. Uh, can you repeat, uh, Brother Benji? Deuteronomy. Chapter 18, verse 21 okay. to 22. Uh, in Jesus' name I read. Huh? Deuteronomy 18, verse 21 to 22. You may say to yourself, how can we know when a message has been spoken by the Lord? Verse 22, if what a prophet claims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. Okay. Now, the Bible says, okay, how do you know that this prophet comes of God? The words is proof from God. What it says down here, if what he says does not happen, then he's false. Full stop. Okay? And you do not have to be afraid of him. So the thing is, if we say that we want the Bible to be true, then everything that the Bible prophesied must be true. If you look at the Bible, they are says with thousands of prophecies. Huh? In fact, some say uh, one third of the Bible uh, is prophecy or prophecy related. Like for example, the recordings of Jesus Christ when he was on earth, which I will be sharing with you, uh, what he does and all these things. Uh, 
there were many things that recorded about him uh, thousands of years before you know he, he even come up to be so the thing is the bible says uh, in in deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 21 to 22 he says that you know it's true okay you know the prophecy is true if it really happens when the time comes so by the fact that the bible prophecies uh, happens according to what it prophesies uh, that proof itself that the bible is true okay so the fulfillment of the prophecies okay proves that the bible is true now there are many things uh, historical events uh, that prophesied like for example i mentioned about uh, daniel's interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dreams we have also events uh, on the last days uh, before the coming of Jesus Christ, including the restoration of Israel after 2,500 years. Now, uh, this uh, is a future topic which I will tell you about it at the later stage. Uh, okay, okay. Um, but what I'm trying to tell you is this: uh, uh, in short, uh, just to say in short, uh, the Bible records uh, that that Israel will be coming back uh, reformed as a nation again. Now we know that 2,500 years ago, Israel was destroyed as a nation. And no, no civilization uh, that has been destroyed for so long uh, can come back as a nation again. You know? But Israel, as prophesied in the Bible, uh, they became a nation again in 1948, as according to the prophecy. Uh, and as we will be hearing uh, in, in later sessions, uh, now this, this prophecy uh, has a very good significance because Jesus Christ mentioned, uh, look at this sign. When this thing happened, uh, you know uh, that the end is near. That means Jesus Christ will come again the second time. Uh, when this prophecy of Israel coming back as a nation, when you see this happening, uh, then you know that I am coming again. So this is a very important prophecy. Now, most important prophecies concerning Jesus Christ in Old Testament is fulfilled. Uh, some say it is 300. Okay, uh, my compilation is 102. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be sending some of these things to you. Okay. And so how can, uh, what we are asking is, how can there be such accurate description of the Messiah unless it's from God? Okay, this proof that not only the Bible is true, but Jesus is the Messiah sent by God. Okay, sorry, my, my thing is a bit messed up. Uh. Let me, whoa, what is happening? Okay, can, can you see this share screen? Sorry. Can, uh, uh, sorry. Now, the question is, is it enough? Uh, is it enough that it's true? Okay, we say it's true. Okay, some prophecies, this thing happened. Uh, but is it from God? Uh, that's a big question mark uh, that we had to ask ourselves. Uh, okay. Does the Bible contain everything? Okay. Now, this was a question uh, uh, that was asked uh, uh, the other day by one, uh, one, one sister, Sister Janice. Uh, he's not here today. Okay. How are the books of the Bible recognized as true? Now, this is a question uh, that was asked. Now, uh, what I'm going to do is this. Uh, I have written something like 10 pages uh, on this matter, which I will send to you by WhatsApp. Uh, okay. So, I uh, hope you enjoy reading this later. But let me give you a very quick summary of what I've written uh, uh, concerning these things. Uh. Now, what I'm trying to tell you in, the, in this thing is that uh, I am in this letter. I'm not trying to tell you that uh, the Bible is true. 
I'm not saying that, okay? The Bible is true, it's proven by uh, the archaeological findings, the prophecies proving the Bible is true, the teachings in the Bible uh, about goodness, righteousness, and all these things. Uh, that gives us that it is something that's right and true. But what I'm trying to tell you here in these writings uh, is that uh, how did the Bible, the books in the Bible, how were they recognized as canons or true writings of God? The first thing that we ask ourselves is this. Uh, because we say that we have, uh, if there is a God out there, the God out there will give us something uh, to guide us so that we can find him. We, we are saying that. And because we are saying that, uh, then if he is going to give us some guidance uh, on how to find him, uh, then we must believe uh, that God would have a hand uh, in the compilation of all these records. So how are these records uh, being provided? Okay. To understand this, uh, we have to understand what was the purpose uh, in which the Bible was written. We have to read this uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17. Um, let's see who is here. Uh, Nicholas Martin, are you here? Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. 2 Timothy okay. chapter 3, verse 16 to 17. Okay, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17. Okay. Verse 16. Sorry, I'm 16. All scripture is God brave and is useful for teaching, debunking, correcting, and training in righteousness. 17. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Why was the Bible giving given to all of us? The Bible is given to us uh, for this purpose. In, in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17, uh, it tells you that the Bible is inspired by God. Yes, there are 40 authors who wrote the Bible. There are about 40 authors. But they, these, the, these books uh, that they wrote uh, were written uh, through the inspiration of God. That means... Uh, now, the word that was used, uh, like just now what Dickens Martyr uh, read, uh, was God brief, you know. God brief means uh, it's as if uh, the writings were written uh, as if God uh, was a writer. And they wrote it uh, as if God was guiding them to write. But what was the purpose of all these writings? The purpose of these writings uh, was that, uh, it, uh, what was read is that all, all scriptures is written through inspiration of God that the man of God uh, um, may be complete, equipped for every good work. What he's trying to tell us is that uh, the Bible is written uh, so that you can be a complete man. That means you know what is right, what is wrong, uh, what will happen okay, if you do this right or wrong. You will recognize okay, what is the will of God. And all these things uh, lead to one thing, uh, that you will be equipped uh, to do the will of God. That means for every good work uh, you are able to do. So this is the purpose of the Bible for all of us, to make you a person uh, that will be able to present yourself before God. Okay? That God, okay? that you can be a chosen of God. Now, when you read the Bible, uh, the Bible is divided into two sections. Old Testament, and the New Testament. The Old Testament, uh, <clears throat> when you talk about Old Testament, one question we ask ourselves, you know, the Old Testament, uh, is it the same as the book, the Hebrew Bible? That means, uh, because the Old Testament, as you know, is a record of the things that happened concerning the Jewish people from the beginning of time, uh, the time was mankind, okay? Adam and Eve, until the time of Abraham. And after Abraham uh, came what you call the time of Patriarch. And then we had Jacob, the formation of the Jewish people. And then all the way up to the time before Jesus Christ. This 
is what we call the records of the, uh, the Old Testament. And to the Jews uh, who believe in Judaism, uh, uh, this was what we call uh, the error of the Jewish nation, the chosen. For them, uh, they have a record called the Jewish Bible. And in, in, uh, in, in Hebrew, uh, the Jewish Bible is also called the Tanakh. Okay? And the Tanakh uh, has three components okay? called the Torah, which is the law, the Navim, which is the, the prophets, the books, writings of the prophets, and Ketumin, which is the writings. So when we talk about the Hebrew Bible, that means the Bible, you must know one thing, uh, that the Jewish God, uh, the, the God that the Jewish people believe, uh, and our God, uh, the Christian God, uh, he's actually the same person. Uh, it's actually the same thing. Except that they recognize that that is a Jewish God. Uh, and in the New Testament time, we recognize that as God. But it's the same God. So it cannot be the writings uh, that was written by the Jewish people are different from the Old Testament. So the question they want to ask everyone on earth here, the Tanakh uh, got 24 books. How many books are there in the New Testament? Anybody know? As Old Testament, sorry. 39. 39. But the Jewish Tanakh, uh, which is the Hebrew Bible, has only 24 books. So are they the same? Ratham? The equivalent. Equivalent. Okay, good. Good answer. Equivalent. Actually, they are the same. Okay. They are actually the same. Okay. The only difference is that uh, in the Jewish Bible, in the Hebrew Bible, they combine some of the books. Like for example, in our Old Testament, we have First Kings, Second Kings, right? We have First Chronicles, Second Chronicles, right? So now uh, I'll be sending you a very long form uh, on this matter. Okay, you, you, you can read it, the ten pages that I've written for you all. Okay, but basically, many of the books were compressed together in the Tanakh. Like for example, uh, we have Malachi, we have Zechariah, we have Habakkuk, we have Nahum, uh, Amos. You know all these books, uh, uh, in the Tanakh, uh, which is the Hebrew Bible, these are called the minor prophets. <laughs> the prof minor prophets. So they compress uh, 13 books uh, of the minor prophets into one book. Okay? And things like, for example, uh, 1st Corinthians, 2nd Corinthians become Corinthians. 1st Kings, 2nd Kings become Kings. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. So by combining all these uh, books and all these things, uh, you end up with 24 books. So, sometimes uh, when you see the debates between the Jews and the Christians, uh, when they quote, uh, for ease of reference, uh, the Jewish debater will use the Old Testament in the debate. <laughs> you know I mean, uh, they'll say your, your Bible verse in 2 Chronicles, like this, like this, like this. They don't go back to the Hebrew Bible because if they go back to the Hebrew Bible, the Christian debater will be a bit confused. You know, which Bible is it now? <laughs> the, the debater, the Jewish debater will use the Old Testament as the reference because they're exactly the same thing. Okay. So, so when you compare the Tanakh, which is the Hebrew Bible versus Old Testament, they're exactly the same thing, except the order, you know, whether Genesis and all these come first and all these things are. Uh, uh, they may change. Of course, uh, the Hebrew Bible, uh, the Torah comes first, the first five books come first, the same order. But some of the others, like for example, the minor prophets, uh, the order may be different. Okay? So, uh, so that is some of the differences. Now, when you also look at the Bible, uh, uh, let me just explain a bit. Uh, you also come across uh, things like deutero, deutero canonical books, Okay, what, what I have written down here, the canonical books are not recognized in the Protestant Bible. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> what is deutero canonical books? Now? Okay, now deutero canonical books uh, basically are books uh, in the Old Testament time. Okay, that means 
Uh, and these Deuteronomy canonical books, uh, basically, you read the Catholic Bible and the Orthodox, Orthodox Bible, uh, Orthodox Greek Bible, there are more books in the Bible, in the Catholic Bible, and in the Greek Orthodox Bible than our Protestant Bible. You, you understand me? Okay. In the Catholic Bible, there are seven more books in the Old Testament. Okay? And in the Orthodox books, uh, there are about uh, 13 more books uh, in the Old Testament than our Protestant Bible that we use. And these books uh, are called Deuterocanonical. Okay. Why do we, why do we uh, use the Protestant Bible and not the Catholic Bible or Orthodox Bible? It's for one simple reason. And the simple reason is that uh, our Bible, the Old Testament that we have, uh, cannot be different uh, from what the Jews themselves use. You, you understand me? Uh, because basically, Christianity take off uh, from the Jewish Judaism era. Okay? You take off from there. So the historical records uh, cannot be different uh, from what the Jews themselves recognize. So we do not accept uh, the Deuteronomical canonical books. Now, uh, you will have a more detailed account uh, in, the, in the WhatsApp uh, when I send you the, the complete text of it. Uh, okay? So today we are not discussing that. Now, why do we accept uh, the Hebrew Bible uh, why do we accept Hebrew Bible? And why, why do we say that the Bible that the Hebrews they use can because Jesus Christ uh, and the apostles uh, used because during the time of Jesus Christ, what they have uh, is not the New Testament. Uh. They don't have a New Testament. New Testament uh, is only written after Jesus Christ's time, uh, after the apostles. Uh. There's no New Testament. What the apostles and Jesus Christ used uh, was only the Old Testament, okay, or the Hebrew Bible. So what did Jesus Christ himself say? Uh, Jesus Christ says uh, that uh, all these things that are written uh, in the law, in the prophets, and in the Psalms uh, are written about me. And many a times uh, Jesus Christ, uh, when, he, when he talked uh, to the Jews and all these things in the debates, uh, he quote Bible verses. And then you also see in the New Testament uh, that when Matthew okay, or, or Peter, they write, uh, they write, uh, and then they will make references back uh, to the Old Testament. So the apostles and Jesus Christ uh, use uh, the Old Testament uh, as the basis uh, of the teaching okay, that is fulfilled by me in this manner, in this manner. So what we are trying to say is that uh, the Hebrew Bible is confirmed to be true by Jesus Christ and the apostles. And therefore, we can accept the Hebrew Bible. <laughs> you, you follow what I mean? Uh? Now, as far as when the Hebrew Bible came about, okay, uh, there's a detailed writing. Uh, it's too long for me to explain. Okay? You, you go and read the account that I write to you, uh, and then you uh, get an understanding uh, uh, how the Hebrew Bible was written, what year uh, was written, you know, how they compile it together, the Dead Sea Scroll, you know, the, the Hebrew Bible uh, that uh, was written. Okay, uh, and then after that, uh, in, in the last century, the Dead Sea Scroll come about, uh, which was 250 BC, and dated back to 250 BC. Uh, and they compare uh, what was the what they have, uh, and then compare back the date 6 which we stated back to 250 BC. Uh, and they found uh, that uh, in the date 6 group, every book of the Bible, except for Esther, is there. Okay, except for Esther is there. And they can find, confirm that the books uh, okay, uh, that is in the Old Test, in the Hebrew Bible, is the same. You know, they can compare back and same. So that we know that. Uh, that this was the books uh, that was used uh, during the time of the apostles and even before the time of apostles. And this was compiled. So uh, you go and read the writings that I, 
I'll be sending to you. Now we come to the New Testament. The question is, uh, why do we need uh, canonization? Canonization means to say that these are the books uh, that is accepted to be the writings of the apostles. Why do we need it? And why do we need to canonize? Why do we need to confirm that these are accepted books? Now, it was well and fine when the apostles were alive. But by the end of the first century, the apostles uh, all dying, okay, were, were gone already. And by the time uh, uh, in the early second century, uh, even the disciples uh, of the apostles, uh, they were also gone. Okay. So what happened was that there was a firm need uh, for the things to be canonized. Canonized. Okay. And there were several uh, things uh, that was needed uh, okay, to, for it to be canonized. Now, what I've written to you, uh, uh, let me just summarize what I've written to you. B says that okay, for it to be canonized, uh, they need to be have certain criteria uh, in which uh, it is to be canonized. Uh. Now, the canonization uh, follow several processes. Uh. Let me just go back to my some writings. Uh. Canonization. Uh. Now, the, the reason why canonization, uh, why you need to confirm which is the books of the Bible is because uh, uh, in Acts chapter 20, verse 29 to 30, <clears throat> Acts chapter 20, verse 29 to 30. Let me see who can read for me. Uh, who is here? Uh, Kim, are you there? Jasmine, Kim? Ah, uh, Kim. Uh, Hi, yes, uh, yes, I'm here, but can I read next time? Uh? Okay, okay, can, no problem. Thank you, okay, thank you. We have this uh, Lin Tai, uh, uh, Miss Lin Tai, can you read? Acts chapter 20, yeah. verse 29 to 30. Acts chapter 20, verse 9 to 20. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Verses 30. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Okay, thank you very much. Now, uh, what we can see down here, Paul already see a problem. That after he's gone, okay, uh, there will be people who will come uh, and change the truth. And as a result of which, uh, uh, there will be problems. Uh, what it means to say is heresies uh, will come. And in fact, in Galatians chapter 1, uh, it tells us that, uh, uh, it says that it, even if we or an angel from heaven will come and preach to you something, uh, that, a something that is not uh, what we have preached to you before, let him be cursed. Take note, uh, even if we or an angel will come to you and preach to you a different gospel, let him be cursed. So Paul is saying, if I will come again and I'm going to tell you something else, okay, not what I preached before, okay, I should be cursed. Or even an angel will come uh, and preach you something else, uh, let him be cursed. So this was a message of Paul. Okay? 
the heresies will come. Okay, not to say that Paul will preach another thing, but he's telling you, telling you that uh, the importance uh, of going back uh, to what was being preached, and therefore because of this, uh, there is a need uh, to recognize uh, what was actually what Paul wrote, what the apostles wrote. The second thing uh, for for the need uh, to have an authentic recorder was because we know that the apostles themselves were dying. Okay? They were dying. So, when they, historically, when they compiled the Bible, there were three, uh, there were three criteria in which they used in how the Bible is compiled, how it come about to be recognized. The first criteria is, uh, they says that the people who wrote this uh, must be the apostles themselves. It cannot be you and I writing. You know, okay? I cannot be so inspired and say, okay, I write something. Cannot. It must be the apostles themselves. I mean, they must have been a personal, personally in contact with Jesus Christ. Okay? Like Paul. Yeah, Paul, after Jesus Christ, you know, went out of heaven. But Jesus Christ directed Paul. You know, he actually taught Paul. You know, okay? So it must be written by those who were associated with Jesus Christ, okay, who had direct contact with Jesus Christ. So you look at the Bible, the New Testament Bible, you see, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Okay, all these people have some way or other, some connection with their, you know, during the time of Jesus Christ, they were there. You know what I mean? Uh? So the writings of Paul, his 13 letters, obviously Paul is associated with Jesus Christ. Revelations, Jude, you know, all these things. Uh, so every book in the Bible, in the New Testament, was something that was belonging to people who had an association with Jesus Christ. So if, say for example, later on, uh, uh, Eusebius, you know, a person who lived in the 300 BC, okay, uh, AD, he write a book. Can we say that that is a canon that is to be inserted in the Bible? Cannot. Now, what also does this mean uh, when we say that it must be uh, apostolic origin? What it actually means is this. The Bible, the New Testament is concerned, is already closed. You know what it means? Uh, it's already closed. That means uh, nobody can subsequently go and say, I write a book and this is included in the Bible. No more. Okay? So that is the first criteria. It must be Apostolic origin. Okay, number one. Number two, it must be recognized among the churches. Now, I will, I'll be telling you uh, in the writings that I sent you after, uh, okay, uh, uh, this is not a complete text of what in my, in my research. Uh, there are also uh, the Acts of Barnabas. <laughs> there are other writings, uh, Acts of Barnabas, Acts of Paul, <laughs> you know, just because the name was there doesn't mean uh, that it, therefore it should be included in the Bible. No. The second criteria is that it must be recognized by the churches. So during a time, because the canonization of the Bible happens in the second, second, second century, second or third century. So amongst the churches at that time, uh, they say that based on their personal contact, because some of them actually know the apostles, you know the apostles, you know, and they are familiar with the writings of the apostles. So they're familiar with whether these things are written. As far as the recollection is concerned, is it true or not? <laughs> so you have things like, for example, the Acts of Barnabas, the Acts of Paul, <laughs> Acts of Peter, the Epistle of, you know, there are so many of these things. Uh, you say that cannot be true, you know. I we, the churches don't recognize it. So this is the second thing. And the third thing was the contents of the books. Okay. So now many of these things uh, were written in this manner, but it's against the other things now. Because uh, anybody uh, can write something and say that, uh, for example, today I write out something and say that uh, this is a letter of Jesus Christ. <laughs> okay, if I write a letter of Jesus Christ to you. And I write all kinds of nonsense inside down there. Will you accept it? 
you can't for two reasons. Number one, uh, we say that the the writings was already closed. Uh. It must be a process. I wrote it, cannot uh, okay. <laughs> and when you insert a content, when you take, check the contents against the other writings in the Bible, it's against them. And so it cannot. In fact, the Bible has one book called The Bell, the Dragon, or something like that. It sounds very nice, uh, no? To have a, 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 a book in the Bible with the word dragon inside down there. But it's not, <laughs> it's not consistent with the Bible. Okay. So, so these are the things uh, that we think. Now, when we look at the the, the Bible, we, we think, uh, historically, this is how it's canonized. Uh. There are three criteria used. It must be apostolic origin. It must be recognized as churches. And the contents of the Bible must be consistent with all the other books. But how do the Bible tell us about all these things? The Bible says, uh, if we read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. Uh, John, can you read? Yes, sure. Just a minute. Chapter 1, chapter 2, right? Eh? Uh, chapter 2, verse 20. 2, verse 20. So I read, Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now, what it means to say, uh, if we talk about doctrines, it means writings, uh, something for us to accept as words from God. Uh, these doctrines must be based on teachings of the apostles and the prophets, whose source of the teachings is traced directly back to Jesus Christ. You understand what I mean? Uh, it says that the foundation built on the apostles and the prophets with Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. So that means, yes, when we talk about these recordings, uh, it must be traced back to the apostles or the prophets, uh, of which uh, is traced back directly back to Jesus Christ. They did not learn it themselves. What I mean, it says that uh, their teachings is from Jesus Christ. Uh. Okay, like Paul is teaching, what he was teaching, he says that my knowledge that I have is useless. Okay, what I have in the past is gone, you know. Okay, but what I have now is the words from Jesus Christ. Okay, the words that I have is not my own. What he's trying to say is this. The second thing is this, uh, if you read in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 to 9. Galatians chapter 6, verse chapter 1, verse 6 to 9. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll read this to you. He says, I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting one who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but some would want to pervert you and confuse you, uh, okay, to pervert the gospel of Christ. And even if he an angel of heaven should proclaim to you a gospel contrary to that which will proclaim, let him be a curse. Okay, let him be a curse. What he's trying to tell you is this, uh, that the teachings uh, must not contradict uh, what the apostles and Jesus Christ had previously preached. So when you talk about the criteria for canonization, uh, it also is similar to what the historical canonization came about. Uh. It must have been based on the apostles or the words of Jesus Christ. You understand? That's why when you look at the New Testament, all these writers, uh, they are the apostles themselves or they are associated with the time and era of Jesus Christ's time. You understand? So there's no more. So you, if you read the book uh, called the book of Pope, whatever, don't read. No point reading. Okay? These are, yeah, they may write... I'm not saying uh, that nowadays uh, there are no people who can speak very well about God and all things, uh, or they, they don't have anything to teach you. I'm not saying that. But to say that they're equal in the Bible, please don't. Okay? It cannot be equal in the Bible. Okay? So, so the Bible itself says uh, that uh, our teachings is based on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Jesus Christ at the chief council. Means all these things can trace back to Jesus Christ. Oh, we are six reading. Okay, let me just finish these two things. So, Canon, Apropoca, Deuteronomy Groups. Now, uh, you, you go and read the thing that I will send to you. Uh, now, at, at this point, any questions? 
Anybody, any questions? Uh, if no, I, I, I just go back very quickly. Oh, why? Let's go back to this. Okay. So, uh, just to summarize, uh, uh, the Bible is written by about 40 old authors. Okay. It's a continuous story uh, about salvation plan of God uh, uh, from the beginning of creation <coughs> to the end. Okay. So, this is a complete story. Now, um, actually, if you go back to, to the question that we previously said, uh, the next session uh, I'm supposed to have you view is concerning uh, Jesus. But as I was preparing this, uh, I was telling myself that if I were to talk on Jesus without touching, without touching on God, uh, it doesn't seem to be uh, the real flow. Uh. So the next session or next session uh, that I'm going to talk about is to talk about God. Okay. Uh, the first thing that we will talk about God uh, is considering God the creator. If we are to believe in God, who is this God supposed to be? Uh, in, in fact, uh, I have jumped the whole thing. The first topic that I should be talking uh, at the very start should be God. Uh, okay? And not these other things. First. Mm -hmm. So uh, I will I will share this question on Jesus Christ. Okay, Although I prepare everything for it. But I'll go back to one true God first. <clears throat> and then at the appropriate time, I will, I will come back to Jesus again. So uh, uh, at this part of time, any questions? Uh, this is the time for question and answers, which I have a few minutes left for question and answers. Any questions that you may have, uh, uh, like what, I'm, what I've just done uh, for Sister Janice, uh, okay, uh, uh, any questions that you have? For me to jot down and for me to respond to you. John, any any question? Yeah, especially uh, when Jesus said that he's coming back, and you mentioned just now he will uh, he will finish the uh, the whole the whole world, right? Mm -hmm. In the second coming. Yes. We have a new Jerusalem. Uh, the the new Jerusalem. Actually, when we talk about Jerusalem, uh, mm -hmm. uh, we, we are not talking about a physical Jerusalem. Okay, all right. That, that, that's my question, actually. Yeah. It's not a physical Jerusalem because, okay. you see, uh, when, when we talk about Jerusalem, Jerusalem has always been there. Okay. So, when we talk about new Jerusalem, as if that something is building on top of Jerusalem, it, it's not happening. Okay, Jerusalem okay. always been there. All right. But okay. the new Jerusalem, what was... What is Jerusalem uh, to the people of the Jews? You see, uh, according to a Judaism religion, there are seven festivals. And in these seven festivals, uh, uh, they, they, are, they are combined into three you know, periods. They are, they are close together into three periods. So according to Deuteronomy, the Jews are required uh, to go to Jerusalem three times a year. Three times a year. And when they pray, uh, they'll pray facing Jerusalem. So what does Jerusalem represent to the Judaism beliefs? Jerusalem uh, is the center of their belief. It's the center of beliefs. What is Jerusalem to Christians? It's the church. The church is the center of belief. Okay? It is where that we will assemble ourselves together. That's why you know, the Jews will go back to Jerusalem three times a year to have the worship. To us Christians, uh, Jerusalem is represented by our church. When, when he says that, uh, New Jerusalem, what do you mean New Jerusalem? He is telling to us uh, that God uh, will build his own, not the physical Jerusalem, but his church. You understand I mean? Uh? Yeah, it's the, new so the Jerusalem uh, is represented uh, in our Christian religion as our church. Okay, as a church. So that, that is a new Jerusalem. Uh. Okay. Any other question? Dickness Martha, any question? 
Hello, uh, so far don't have lah. <laughs> okay, Brad Tom, any questions that you have? I was uh, pondering, you know, this uh, this uh, Christian as well as the this uh, Muslim, they are these uh, Jews, as you say, they are facing this uh, Jerusalem and they pray, just like these uh, Muslim, they they face to Mecca when they pray. What is uh, you know? What's the difference? Uh, what is the similarity there? Okay. Um... Just to let you know, uh, the Jews uh, has always been looking forward to uh, what you call that, uh, the restoration of Israel, restoration of Israel. And Jerusalem has always been their centerpiece uh, of their, their kingdom. Uh, eh? The kingdom, because uh, this was the promised land, this was something that is promised to them. So that's, that's why when during this Jesus Christ time, uh, uh, Jesus Christ also asked, okay, when will you restore back uh, the kingdom back again? <laughs> you know, they asked that. So even among the disciples, they were asking about the restoration of Jerusalem, restoration of the Jewish empire, you know. But obviously, we, we all know uh, that Jesus Christ, uh, when he comes, uh, it's not to restore back the Israel nation again. Okay, his purpose was the restoration of the eternal kingdom. Okay, now as far as the Jews is concerned, they are still looking forward uh, to the Messiah. To look forward to the restoration of a physical kingdom. Now. so therefore, uh, we know that the Jews was were were dispersed. Uh, 2,500 years ago into different, different nations all over the world. You know? okay? in, in fact, they are, recently, they, they were Jews who came back from China back into Jerusalem. You know? And we also know that uh, sometime back in the 1970s, uh, there were Jews uh, from Ethiopia also fly back to Jerusalem, you know? come back to Jerusalem. So there were all these people looking forward to Jerusalem. So therefore, as far as the Jews is concerned, uh, Jerusalem uh, is their holy city. So when they pray, uh, they face towards Jerusalem. Of course, I'm, I'm not saying that all Jews do that. Uh, okay? Because among the Jews, uh, there are three groupings, uh, the Orthodox, the Ultras, and also the Generalists. Okay? So the, 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 the modern type of Jews, uh, they are no longer very religious. Uh, okay? The Ultra and Orthodox, uh, the Ultra are ultra religious okay and orthodox they are the moderate ones okay who 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 have you know some deep belief as well but what i'm trying to say is that jerusalem remains a special place in the hearts of the jews so in their prayers especially amongst the ultra jews uh, they were faced towards jerusalem which is something that uh daniel you know, daniel himself does that uh, he opened his window and they face towards jerusalem and they pray that. Uh, but this is not something that is for us. Uh. Now, for the Muslims, for example, it's different. They pray, they pray, they face towards Mecca. But do you know that in history, uh, for a time uh, when, when this, uh, when this Muhammad, uh, okay, when he started his religion, uh, at the start, uh, he teach his believers uh, to face towards Jerusalem. <laughs> do you know that? Uh? <laughs> It's only because uh, he was preaching in Jerusalem uh, and the people rejected him. They rejected him. Uh, so he had to flee and he went to Mecca. Okay, he flew to Mecca. And after that uh, incident, uh, you know, Mecca became the central point. And so therefore, any Muslim that prayed that they have this kitbah, you know, they had a face towards Mecca, the direction of, of things. So you go to your hotel rooms, uh, you see the arrow up there. Uh, and that is for the Muslim that pray they had to face that direction. But uh, of course, to us Christians, it's meaningless to us. Uh, right? We don't face any direction. Uh, okay? Because heaven is not there or there or there. Okay? <laughs> heaven is up there. We don't know where. We just have to pray. That's all. Uh. Okay. Any other questions, brother? Don't have. Uh. Okay. What about uh, Miss Kai? Ning Tai? Uh, Miss Nana. Uh, no. 
Good question, huh? Uh, Kim, you have any questions? Uh, no question yet. No question, huh? Okay, so if there are no questions, then uh, I'll end the session here. I'll, uh, I'll do two things for you all. I'll send to you all the, uh, the, the notes that I've written, the 10 pages. I hope uh, you have a good time reading it. And on top of that, uh, next session, uh, next session is next week. Hey, when is the... No, sorry. When is the... What? Uh? Uh, 19 June. Uh. Is it? Yes. Okay. Uh, next week, we'll still have our session okay, at 5 p.m. But on the 19th June, uh, because we, we have an adult fellowship in our Subang Jaya Church, so uh, because of that, uh, we will not be able to host this session. Uh, okay, So uh, just think on that. Next week, we'll be on uh, One True God. Okay, We'll talk on One True God. So uh, without further ado, if there are no questions, then we have our prayer. We pray the Lord Jesus Christ to guide us in our future sessions. Uh, any questions, uh, please drop in a line, put in the WhatsApp, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll answer your question as it goes by. Okay, uh, shall we? In Jesus' name, let's pray. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Thank you, Lord God, for the grace and mercy and the blessings upon each and every one of us. Help us, O oh Lord Jesus Christ, guide us, lead us, O oh Lord Jesus Christ. O oh Lord, praise Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For the growth of the Lord Jesus Amen. Okay, uh, thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you, sir. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Okay. Bye.